No matter how closely we follow the news or current events, we all pretty much remember the major financial crisis of 2008 that was dubbed the subprime mortgage crisis. When it happened, most news sources dubbed it the Day of Reckoning, as foreclosures on homes skyrocketed due to people being unable to pay their debts, and in large part due to people receiving loans that should never have been granted them in the first place. Interest rates on savings plummeted, and people planning to retire with their accrued savings plans could no longer afford to do so, because their plans were often largely based on mutual funds and the performance of the stock market, which was bottoming out at the time. Yet, with all this turmoil and aftershock from what was often simply defined as quote-unquote corporate greed, many people were still unaware of what really happened and why our economy was sinking. Although the intricacies are exceptionally complex, and in many cases, still unknown due to a lack of disclosure, one of the most boiled down and easy to grasp explanations came in March of 2010 when Michael Lewis, author of other top bestsellers such as Moneyball, which became a movie, came out with one of the most important books of our time, in my opinion, called The Big Short. In an industry that is predicated on confidence in being able to accurately predict future value, hindsight is nothing short of 2020. If you are going to look back at some of the post-crisis analysis, pretty much every major news outlook refers back to the situation as something inevitable that they had foreseen years in advance. But Michael Lewis not only sheds light on the issue, but also presents us with real examples of individuals who saw this coming and were actually able to profit off of it. Lewis, a journalist and writer, whose previous books include Liar's Poker and The Blind Side. Welcome to you. Thank you. Your way into this is not the big epic sweep, but these few characters who were running against the pack. Why was that a way in? Well, uh, it was, it was, first, it was a fantastic story that I couldn't believe hadn't been told that the, the financial world had essentially, between 2005 and 2007, organized itself around a giant bet. And the entire financial system, but for a few, were on one side of the bet. They were, they were betting on the subprime mortgage market. And on the other side were a handful of people who sort of saw what was happening. What did they see? What did they see that everybody else didn't see? They saw, different people saw different things, but they saw the corruption of, of lending standards in, in, in the subprime mortgage market. They saw the corruption of the ratings agencies that led to bonds that should never have been rated being rated triple A. They saw, they, saw the, they saw the investment banks, the large Wall Street firms, which had always kind of been the smart money at the table, becoming the dumb money at the table. I mean, it, it, historically, the last thing you wanted to do was be on the other side of a trade of Morgan Stanley or Goldman Sachs. They saw that, that actually there was a trade to be on the other side Suddenly of it. It made, made sense. Good sense. It made good sense. The book chronicles a series of investors that, unlike the majority of everyone involved in the crisis, from the financial institutions to the people signing mortgages, actually read the fine print in the contracts and were able to see that something was drastically off. Some of the investors that were chronicled were Michael Burry, who was a doctor by day and a fund manager by night, who due to his Asperger's syndrome was perfectly fine with sitting in his office alone and reading through the contracts instead of interacting with his patients. Steve Eisman, a New York investor who was a very difficult and introverted character that was seemingly disinterested in the feelings and emotions of others due to his perception that other investors were all corrupt, and as the book develops, his distrust seems to grow and confirm his bias. James Mai and Charlie Ledley, who started their enterprise, Cornwall Capital, in a garage in Berkeley with $110,000. But more importantly, the ability to bet not only against a corporation, but the entire financial institution, which perfectly complemented their risk-taking natures. And among several others, Greg Lippmann, who was a confident, crude trader at Deutsche Bank, who with the assistance of a brilliant quant named Eugene Su, essentially created and exploited the collateralized debt obligation market, or CDO. So what is a collateralized debt obligation? In a nutshell, CDOs are asset-backed packages that are comprised of individual loans 
that are bundled together into a simple product that can be sold to investors. These types of packages are made up of auto loans, credit card debt, corporate debt, and as the coup de gras in this particular scenario, mortgages. As many of the financial institutions figured, it would be most profitable to bundle mortgages by the hundreds or even thousands, because that would provide hundreds or thousands of times over more cash flow than trading individual mortgages. Each CDO was split by layers, also called tranches, determining its riskiness, with AAA rated bonds having the lowest yield due to their alleged safety, and B rated bonds having the highest yield due to their high risk of default. Once the profit potential of CDOs was recognized, many ratings agencies like Standard & Poor's were easily manipulated into taking toxic B rated bonds and labeling them AAA. The problem, Lewis explains, is that these CDOs became so complex that buyers didn't really know the value of what they were buying. They relied on trusting their consultants and bankers to do the research, which, as history shows us, happened to fail terribly. What the aforementioned investors managed to do was little other than due diligence, and upon realizing that the loans that were being made were often as toxic as they could possibly be, with debt being incredibly easy and cheap to accumulate, and the bar was extremely likely to default, people like Barry, Eisman, and Littman bought credit default swaps from firms such as AIG, who were essentially convinced that housing prices would rise infinitely. These credit default swaps that were bought for a small fee were basically nothing other than insurance that they were buying in case a bond would default. Essentially, this was a bet against a market that was assured that housing prices would never go down. But default they did. Big time. In many cases, in reading the fine print, if even one person defaulted on their mortgage out of a CDO comprising a thousand loans, the entire thing would collapse. So, while the handful of investors that Lewis Chronicles were reading the fine print of their contracts and logging long hours in at the office, many of our largest financial institutions were trying to maximize what they were certain was foolproof capital accumulation. People like Michael Burry knew that the entire industry would collapse. They just didn't know when. So they spent their time trying to handpick the most toxic CDOs that they could find and then purchasing credit default swaps on them. When the dust cleared, the people chronicled in the big short emerged with millions, if not billions, of dollars for doing what they simply should have been doing the entire time, while our economy was in ruins. The title The Big Short refers to the actions taken by the book's main figures. In financial terms, Shorting something is making a bet that its price or value is going to go down. Although the full range of the meltdown was extremely complex, Lewis manages to portray it in a way that anyone can understand. This book, which was on the New York Times bestseller list for 28 weeks, puts on a full display of the contrast between diligent hard work and the consummate quote-unquote greed, and has since opened the eyes of countless members of the public, as well as the financial and governmental sectors, and showed the outcome of what happens when the two collide.